also learned how to program computers. And then in 2001, we start the first video games company for mobile phones in Spain called Microjogs. In 2013, my studio was acquired by a big company. Some of the guys and myself, we decided that we should do something fresh, something new, and we found it on the run. Titan Roll is a real-time strategy game. It's uh, considered as a MOBA. MOBA is a massive online battle arena, but especially designed for mobile devices. The game is today as it is thanks to the Early Access program. We changed many things from the learnings from the community. Since we launched the game on Early Access, we got more than 2 million installs on Android devices. We started in the Early Access program back at the very beginning of it. The difference between the Early Access program and a traditional soft launch is that users are actively giving the team feedback. So you don't only check the metrics you have, but they also provide possible solutions. So you end up by doing the game players want to play. The thing about not having the ratings, but do having the constructive feedback was very good. The Early Access was a great opportunity for an indie developer, someone starting, and very key for us in Omnitron. When we started with the Early Access program, we approached it in different stages. So the idea was at the beginning to focus on the engagement of the games. Once we sorted that out, we focused on the retention of the game. And finally, we focus on monetization to do a valid product for the market. We managed with early access to improve our retention in a 41%, the engagement by a 50% and the monetization by a 20% from the very beginning of the program till worldwide launch the game. I feel very happy working on the video games industry because it has been my passion since I was a child and it's really inspiring that through Omnidron we have a real chance to shape the new era of the video games. Absolutely amazing. Um, hi, my name is Adam Gutterman and uh, I'm going to be leading a panel today about launching successfully on Google Play. Um, that story about Omnidrone just kind of confirms for me that all developers are dreamers. They're trying to build an experience, a world that they envision here, up here in their, in their heads, in their dreams, and they're trying to actualize it through software and through a, a mobile or whatever kind of development environment. And, and that's the challenge of game development. And it's not always the easiest thing to do to kind of actualize those ideas and, and get them into software and get them in front of users in a way where you're really com communicating that artistic idea that you want to you wanna put forth. And that's why we built Early Access. It's one of the pillars of launching on play. It's this safe sandbox development environment, where as you saw from the guys at Omnidrone when they were devel developing Titan Brawl, they were getting great feedback, they were able to increase their metrics and really kind of communicate their idea in a really beautiful way by the time they launched on play. And they had a beautiful game and a 4.7 rating by the time the game came out, all through Early Access. We've actually got 150 games already through the gate of early access, and we're continuing to expand that program. And the other program that we're going to talk about today is pre-registration. Uh, who here was f uh, here for the keynote? Yeah, a lot of you. So you saw we've got some beautiful games uh, that we just announced this morning coming through uh, the pre-registration program. So please go to play and, and uh, pre-register for those. We've actually put over 100 other games already through the program, and that's expanding. Between those two programs alone, we've had over 60 million players come through. And it's been absolutely phenomenal to see the reaction of players playing these games in early access and giving feedback to our developers, players signing up to be notified on day one, on launch day, for when these favorite, their favorite games are going to be coming out. Out. And these programs continue to grow. And if you're a developer and you think you've got a, a game that is uh, you know, going to be ideal for one of these programs, please reach out to us here at Google Play and we can have that conversation as well. In the meanwhile, we're going to bring out some, uh, some great people, some uh, people that I've been working with for a very, very long time in game development, some people that can talk about uh, early access and pre-registration a lot better than I can because they actually use these programs. So welcome our panelists out to the stage. All right, so first things first, can you guys please introduce yourselves? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Autumn Brown. I work at EA, and I, uh, I run our publishing team. So I get to work with all of our studios and make sure they use awesome tools like pre-registration. Hey, I'm Sarah Miller. I work at Nix Hydra Games, which is a small um, indie-ish 
a game company. Uh, we focus on building games for young women, uh, which we view as like a pretty underserved audience in the mobile industry currently. Hi, I'm Joe Rabin. I was a founding product guy at Space Ape Games. It was a 15-person studio. We launched Samurai Siege and grew up to 100 people. Right now, I'm the product owner on a new game. It's a kart racing game that's in early access. Hi, uh, I'm Sean Rutland, the CEO of Hutch. Um, we are based in London and Brighton in the UK. We've got 50 staff. Um, we're super focused and passionate about racing games and reimagining racing games uh, for mobile. All right, since you both mentioned racing games, uh, and you're both kind of developing the same space, and I think you guys have both used early access, is that right? Uh, let, let's start there. I think that's a great place to start. Yeah, so last year we had a great experience using uh, early access. Um, we've got a very different take on racing. Everyone thinks of racing as a, a typical um, skilled-based racing game. We've got, we've got two games coming out this year. One's a collectible card trading racing game, so we had no idea if this game was going to work, resonate with consumers. Um, and we, we used um, early access to, to validate that. And so the, the, the first initial months, we were getting um, some pretty fascinating feedback from players, a lot around art style. So I actually treat early access a bit different than soft launch, which soft launch for us is more about optimization and um, making sure that we can optimize economies as well as device um, optimizations. But what was really exciting was the qualitative feedback that was coming through um, early access which led us to understand that the, pl the, that the way we were representing our game needed to change, and we changed it. And day one retention, I think, went up like 15% uh, because we got 30% more people through the tutorial, and then day seven increased. So, so to have a program that you can use that can actually really influence like, the very early stages of your development, I think that's, that's really powerful for developers. And you mentioned uh, you got feedback on the art style. That was something you guys were testing. Yeah, so because it's a collectible card trading game, it's, it's going to get the Guinness Book of Records for having the most licensed cars uh, in a game. So it's got about 2,500 cars. Wow. Um, we're using photos for the cars, but we represented those cars as dots in a racetrack. Mm -hmm. We thought that was pretty cool. We thought that's, that's a good idea because production-wise, we don't want to model 2,500 cars. Mm -hmm. um, players told us they want to see cars. Yeah. So uh, there was a, like an emotional disconnect. And um, what we did was we found a different way to represent each car in the game through 3D. And we've never, in the history, in, in the last five years that we've been building these games, we've never seen an art style or an art uh, change that's made an impact on retention. But this, this made a huge impact. So. Um, it was a really big learning for us, and it kind of changed the culture in terms of you can never soft launch, uh, soft launch earlier or get the game out earlier. You always want to do things to the game, um, but actually you just need to get the game out there and, and, and start seeing if the core principles of your game are working. Great stuff. Yeah, it's similar for us. Early access means we can go out to real players just earlier. And when you've got a game that's really risky, like we want to make the defining kart racing game on mobile, lots of people have tried, and there's been some success previously, but there's never been that game that's, uh, that game that's defined the genre and like, captured the attention of millions of people. We thought controls is an issue, so we wanted to try something totally different on controls. We want to see how people respond to the controls. We put it out there and we thought, oh, these controls that we've got, which is portrait, and it's got an arrow, and you kind of drag the back of the car, but like game that you made previously. Yeah, I, I, can, I can feel it. <laughs> uh, we thought, these controls are awesome. They work really, really well. Put it out to players, and turns out they didn't work as well as we hoped that they would. And so we're like, OK, we've got a couple of other control methods. <clears throat> Let's test them. So we're completely changing the way that players interact with the game. And there's a paradigm when you come in, is this an arena game? Is this a game that you're battling against other players from day one? Or is there a gentle, more linear introduction into the game? Is there going to be a map? So we tested three different control methods and two different ways of onboarding players into the game that couldn't have been like more chalk and cheese. And we found that one of those combinations that we were testing, one of those combinations meant that we were getting an extra, I don't know, 12% uh, day one retention, which is pretty nice. And over early access, in total, we were able to like, move our retention up significantly. I mean, I think 60% higher than where we started. So it access is cool, because you can ask the big questions and get real answers from real players. 
And it's not just New Zealanders that use early access as well. Not just it's New Zealanders <laughs> living in London, but it helps. <laughs> New Zealanders are making racing games. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, cool. Well, let's. Uh, thanks for that uh, kind of insight about early access. Uh, let's uh, let's move on to pre-registration. Um, Sarah, you guys uh, had a, a really really successful pre-registration campaign, one that kind of surprised everyone here and maybe even surprised you guys. I don't know. You want to tell us about it? Yeah, I mean that's really great to hear that it surprised everyone. Um, we were lucky we had a game that had gotten really successful beforehand, um, just sort of organically. It's called Egg Baby, um, and it was just really, really popular with young girls. Um, so we wanted to make a better version of that because we felt like they deserved it. Um, so while we were in pre-registration with the new game, Egg, uh, we had about three to 400,000 monthly active users in Egg Baby. Um, so we were able to cross-promote to the pre-registration page. We ended up with like 250,000 pre-registrations, which was so helpful for us on day one. Uh, I think that turned into something like 40,000 day one downloads, and that was before we had started any of our other marketing, um, which was amazing for us because it, uh, when we started our marketing, it made it easier for people to search, people to see it in the charts already. Um, so yeah, it definitely uh, really helped our, our launch. So you just did straightforward cross-promotion. Did you use any other like uh, social channels or CRM channels? Yeah, we have about uh, 175 likes on Facebook, so 175,000 likes on Facebook. So we, we promoted it there as well, um, linking to the, the Google Play Store. Um, and yeah, it definitely, definitely helped. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, I know, Autumn, you guys have been uh, whales on the program. You guys have done several <laughs> uh, very successful, very large uh, present uh, pre-registration campaigns with us. Uh, can you share your experience? Sure. Anytime Google's willing to feature you, we will, we will jump at that. So <laughs> we were very happy to hear. Um, the first time we used it, we've, we've run seven programs. Um, our first one was Need for Speed, No Limits. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, you know, we weren't quite sure how to, how to use it, but Google was great. They walked us through it. Um, that one we ran two weeks prior to launch, mm -hmm. and we were happy. We didn't really have a benchmark at that time to see you know, what success looked like. But similar to what Sarah mentioned, we noticed that our week one installs were slightly higher than we expected them to be. Um, and then we also noticed that our top chart ranking moved a little bit quicker, and then also keyword search was something that um, we would keep an eye on at launch, and it would take us a few weeks to earn the clout you know, from the store to, to show up in certain keywords. So having that pre-registration, that wave of people come in on day one or day two seemed to really help that. And then we've been using it. Like I said, we've, we've run seven campaigns. Our last one was FIFA Mobile, which we launched this fall. And that one we did a little different. Um, that one we, we launched several weeks in advance of our worldwide launch date. And I think we were all really happy with the, the results of that. So not only did we, we had more lead time with that to talk about the launch and what we were doing, um, we also worked really closely with the play team to provide uh, regionalized assets. So we made sure that the content was relevant to that country. Uh, and Google was great about helping us get exposure in each of those countries um, over the, the weeks leading up to launch. And that was by far our most successful pre-registration campaign. That's awesome. And you guys, um, you guys did kind of a traditional reveal of FIFA Mobile, like at, uh, was it at Gamescom? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, ex yeah, we, we have a lot of uh, history with launching games, so we have a, a bit of a playbook. And it was nice to be able to tap into that with this. And it gave us an action for players. So you know, a lot of us are making free games these days, and it's, it's an impulse for people to go and install. When you tell them it's coming a few weeks from now, it's probably pretty easy for them to forget it. Um, so, but we, it was nice to be able to say, you can actually take an action, go and pre-reg on Google Play, and you'll be notified when it launches. So we did, we, we folded that into our Gamescom uh, program, and then throughout the, the weeks leading up to it, uh, alongside the Google Play support, we did a lot of social media support um, to make sure that it was a constant message to our players. And it was a pretty similar situation with uh, that you saw with Need for Speed. It was just like an accelerated kind of experience. Very much accelerated. Yeah. 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 I think we've learned a lot. You know, each pre-reg we do. Um, another big, you know, key part of the pre-registration is, of course, the offer that you're promoting. Um, it's nice to be, you know, the first to know when the game launches, so that might be enough. But we always also, and I think it's a Google Play best practice to include some sort of a, a pre-registration offer. 
Um, so, you know, really making sure that offer makes sense, especially if somebody's never played your game before. So um, if it's a racing game, a car is really easy to understand versus maybe like a coin value. So we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what could make sense to go along with that. Sign up to be the first to know and you'll get XYZ um, those first couple days. You know, it's interesting you mentioned the FIFA launch. Um, that actually kind of changed our minds about the program as well. Because uh, up until then, we'd had anywhere from like, you know, two to four weeks of a lead time. You guys had this proposal, you know, going live at Gamescom and then launching two months later. And, and we saw that, you know, if you have a very kind of uh, traditional marketing, you know, lead up, you know, with, with, you know, solid beats all the way through, all the way through launch, you could really drive like a consistent growth. And even somewhat similarly, but a little bit different. We saw something similar with uh, PVC Heroes, where you had a very long uh, pre-registration program, but the velocity didn't seem to slow down. It seemed to continue to go forward all the way through launch. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so Plants vs. Zombies Heroes was another game um, that we did a pre-registration campaign for. Um, that one was, I think, almost close to two months. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think a really key part of that was Google helping us keep that message relevant and front and center to players. So, um, you know, I think around that time, too, Google had launched the consistent um, merchandising area in the store, which helps players get used to finding these pre-registered games that are available for pre-registration or early access. Um, so I think it just helps that visibility in the store and, you know, keeping the game top of mind as we continue to fine tune leading up to worldwide launch. Awesome. Good to hear. Um, we've got a little bit more time left. Uh, we'll take some questions, but real quick, I just wanted to, do you guys have any, like, random thoughts that you wanted to share about launching on play? Just kind of, you know, thoughts, memories, best practices, recommendations? I think we're going to take questions now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so there's a couple of mics uh, just right there in the aisles. Just kind of line up, and uh, we'll take them one at a time. You over there? I can't hear you. Shout really loud if it's not on. <laughs> All right, no worries. It, it, no, there we go. Okay, so I was just too close. Not a big deal. Anyway, uh, thanks for letting me uh, be up here and pick your brain. I have a bit of a food for thought question. Um, what are your thoughts, uh, each one of you, on challenges you faced on a storefront like Google Play, specifically on visibility? And what do you think uh, community solutions slash industry solutions for visibility on uh, proprietary storefronts would be like? Sorry if it's a bit of a loaded question. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so I think for us, because we're small, we did a really uh, clear accounting before we launched of what our assets were and what our strengths were and what we just couldn't do. Um, so we looked at our previous games and uh, we looked at our social media following and we thought really hard about how to reach those people first and foremost. And then outside of that, um, we, don't, we didn't have a huge budget for acquisition, so we were really careful about um, picking the right keywords, uh, making a description, um, testing out our icon beforehand and making sure that at every step of the way, um, users who would want to find our game would be able to find our game and it would appeal to them at every, at every point um, in that process. So uh, just a really careful accounting of, of what your strengths and your assets are beforehand for sure. Yeah, the other way you can do it is see if your game appeals to any form of non-game group. Like, I think there's a great talk coming up later at GDC around launching, launching a game based on the TV series Vikings. And so Vikings obviously has a rabid fan base of people who like Vikings. Same with the Walking Dead games. Like, you are able to tap into a community that loves something. And it might not be that you have a big brand associated with it, but uh, say there's a, a YouTuber that you know that really, really loves talking about driving carts and you happen to meet those people and go like we've got this game what do you think of it maybe they'll be interested in chatting with you about the game and a lot of the big name youtubers at the moment are being contacted by everyone so you can't just rock up to you know a really influential influencer who's in the gaming scene but you might be able to say i've got a friend he's launching a rally computer he happens to know who one of the most famous rally drivers co-driver is and he's getting him involved in the development of his product and I think that story holds true. Like, if, it's, if there's a non-game interest to it and you can get that person involved and maybe even get them into the game or make them feel some ownership of their game, 
then you can use their natural marketing reach, someone that other games companies aren't touching because all of the obvious ones are gonna be pretty well locked up. And maybe their community, that's something slightly different. Your game has an appeal to them and you can genuinely give that person some value because who doesn't want to appear in a game? It's like the 21st century version of appearing in a movie. So you might be able to do something like that uh, or you might just be able to have a really, really cool icon. <laughs> Um, sorry if this comes across wrong, but maybe building a game that doesn't rely on the store. So a business that has a good LTV, cost per acquisition model, blah, blah, blah. Like, like that's how we see it. Like store, store positioning is, is great. It's, it, you know, we're very grateful for Google support, but, but we're actually building games that can be commercially successful. So. Yeah, and I guess just to echo, you know, leverage all the tools. You know, I think Google Play does a really good job of allowing us direct access to the players in a lot of ways. So icon testing was mentioned up here. That's huge. For Need for Speed No Limits, um, we recently just did one. I know we're not talking about A-B testing, but we did a hot pink logo. And everybody in the studio was like, what is that? Like, why are we putting that out there? That was so off-brand, and it was by far the best performer. So it'll surprise you what you find out. Just you know, leverage the tools, and then speak to your players. You have the ability in the reviews section of the, the store as well, and having that two-way conversation, I think, really, it just helps bring a lot of things to, to light that maybe we don't consider. Thank you. Uh, the second part of that question was, how are you guys individually valuing and testing your penetration indexes? Uh, for like uh, being able to communicate and appeal directly to your core demographic audience that you've uh, identified in your research. Did you say testing it specifically, or yeah, like how do you how do you validate that? How have you guys validated that in the past? So so early access is really good for that. So when we were building this collectible card trading racing game, uh, which is coming out in July, by the way, um, <laughs> uh, well. We had, a, we had a business hunch and a gut instinct that these players, that the super fans of these players would come from a very specific uh, community. Mm -hmm. So in early access, we started testing user acquisition to that community and it was validated. So um, that's, that's how we, we typically use like a space or a service like, like early access. Yeah, one of the cool things about early access is uh, if you're a player that goes into the early access and has a look at featuring, you're a particular type of player, right? You're, you're looking for something new. And the language around it when you're downloading the game, it's like, thanks for trying our in-development game. And it says it's in early access and it could be unstable. It means you can put it out early. It's like really, really nice badging. But it's just the right level of obtrusiveness that we can still do user acquisition through channels that we know. So we can go like, I want to target these guys on AdWords. So I want to target these guys on Facebook. I want to target these guys on uh, YouTube. You can just choose what channel you want and see how effective it is and bring those people in. And then you have information around the demographics of those guys as well. And you see what channel your game is resonating with. Like, what's your D1 on this group versus that group? So even though the group of people who use early access and kind of seek out early access, might be different from your regular players. It's, the messaging is just at the right point that means you can still acquire through traditional channels and not really see much of a hit versus acquiring uh, on a non-early access game. Okay, last part, and I'm, I'm, I'm gone. Um, <laughs> biggest challenge with that, biggest challenge with the Google Play Store, go. Well, for us, uh, we're using a lot of these tools really early on, so uh, we just have to communicate a lot with our, our contacts directly because some of the stuff hasn't made its way um, to be exposed to the developer uh, in the console yet. Um, so that's really exciting. It's really great to be able to use that. But we do have to like stay in touch very regularly. We had to email our contact to make sure we knew how many pre-registrations we had, um, which was fine. That's not a huge deal, but it, it was, you know, Small challenge. <laughs> I'll probably get in trouble, but China, <laughs> <laughs> I think, would be one of our, you know, we have a lot of players, and we'd love to work with Google to be there, so. <laughs> I'll tie that one, too. <laughs> Thank you. Duly noted. <laughs> uh, I've got a question on early access, which I've done kind of like a manual early access in the past, and I've got feedback some good feedback, some not so good. I wonder if you had any tips or best practices for getting effective feedback in early access. So you get, I guess you get two channels. 
one of which is the one of which is the reviews that you get from players, and I find those really really useful in that uh, it helps make sense of your analytic and of your analytics, which is the other channel. So I think your game should be well instrumented when it goes in. So uh, I was uh, being a product guy. I kind of think doing an A/B test of things that are really really radically different, like should the game be a, an arena-based game or should the game be a map-based game when you first start playing it? They're like two completely different pieces of content. Think if you're relatively early on in game development, you should take the effort to make both and see how it works. If you have a feeling that either of them should work, I'm not saying you should always hedge your bets, but right at the start, I think you take advantage of this early group and the fact that they are early and they can radically inform where your game goes. Not just like, should the font be Helvetica or should the font be Comic Sans, but uh, how should you fundamentally interact with this game? I think you take the opportunity to ask those questions through A-B tests. The other thing that you can do, which is really, really nice, is just have a button in your game that's take a survey. Uh, one thing we wanted to do, and I think we will do for our early access games going forward, because I think we're going to use it again, is take a leaf out of Ubisoft's book, where it's just like, hey, rate this mission. Rate what, what are you enjoying? And have a little system to ask just one or two questions that might be top of our mind, but within the app. So you can get all the unstructured feedback, and that gives color to your analytics. You can run A-B tests, and you can see uh, if you should take the game in one direction or not, or, or that it doesn't matter, and that you just go with your design instincts. Uh, and you can directly ask players in-game what they think. And maybe that would be a cool product, product thing that Google could offer. Like, <laughs> Duly <-game> noted. <laughs> <laughs> but don't do that because it'll give us an edge when we design and have it in order of argument. <laughs> Thank you. So I have a question. Um, I imagine a lot of people in this studio, or the audience, um, don't necessarily either have a major studio behind them or a previously successful product with six figures plus of installs. If how much data, like, you know, I mean, user acquisition is very expensive. Uh, we did it with NASCAR slots and it was like, amazing that the, the cost it gets into. So if you're small, and obviously, you're not going to try and buy 100,000 installs with a reasonable budget. How, much, how many installs would you say is enough to be viable? Is 100 players playing your game enough to work with? 1,000? If you had a brand new product, how much would you expect? And maybe a budget. Is $10,000 a, a joke? Is that way more than you need to spend? I mean, give us an idea of how you would do if you're starting from no installs. So with our game, we, I, th I think we had three to 5,000 players for a couple of months. Um, and to answer the question that was asked before, um, we had some really good social tools that we could communicate with these guys. So, um, so you can actually like, gain, gain a lot of insight that's, that's qualitative. And, um, but yeah, I, I don't think you need to get 100,000 players to, to start getting decent data about what's going on. You won't learn about monetization, but you'll certainly learn about retention. Yeah, it's to do with how big your uptake group is. One of the reasons you won't learn about monetization is if, say, 5% of your players convert, and then what you really want to do when comparing two groups is get a population size of about 200. I know there's precise statistics and you can do statistical significance, but you want to get an uptake group of about 200, and if only 5% of people are converting, you know, that means that you need 10,000 players. However, if you're looking at something that's a little bit, a little bit different and you want to run a single A-B test normally getting about 400 players to have 200 in each group. If those things are significantly different, and I said you shouldn't be running A-B tests against like font type, running A-B tests around really, really big things. Mm. There's an argument that's been put forth that says any A-B test that you need like 10,000 players to run means you're not testing bold enough and you're being pretty wussy <laughs> when it comes to the decisions that you're making. So if you can't find the answer with 500 players for a single test where there's just two variations, in fact, we use it. You probably need 600 because we want 200 in each group. I do. I always do a null control group to make sure that there's nothing going wrong with the A/B test distribution. But yeah, about 600 players for a single test. So if you want to run four tests, you need about two and a half thousand players in order to run that. So that's one way that you could look at it, but it's a pretty over-the-top quantity way to look at it. Thanks. Yeah, I'll echo. Oh, sorry, sorry. 600 is like where my benchmark is for when I'm trying to decide whether or not uh, to move forward with a feature. So same. Great. Nice. <laughs> Thank you.
This question is for Sarah Miller. I actually had a question since you said that you released games targeting with the target audience being young girls. Uh, did you have any audio techniques that helped give you advantages towards um, your game in the marketing, towards your marketing strategy? Were there any audio techniques that gave you like an upper hand against any other people out um, there in the industry? <laughs> I wasn't directly involved with the audio at all. I believe that we ended up outsourcing it. Um, I mean, having great audio is, is good. Um, I do find that a lot of players tend to turn off their audio on mobile. Um, so for the people who turn it on, it probably means a lot to them, right? But uh, for the people who have it off, they're never going to hear it. But um, yeah, I don't have any specifics for you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I guess my question is, uh, with Google Early Access, when you're such a small studio, people don't really know who you are, you don't have a budget for advertising, is that something that is still a viable option for smaller studios like mine? Yeah, well, we actually have a permanent place on play for Early Access. So if you're accepted into the program, there is a permanent collection. It's a little pill right below the, the highlights or right below the banners where uh, anybody who's interested in joining the early access community from a consumer side can come in and see what's, uh, see what's available and then check it out. And we actually, uh, the program is designed for developers of all sizes. Uh, developers of, of your size for sure have been taking advantage of the program uh, very, very well because Again, you, uh, you kind of have that problem uh, acquiring yeah. enough users to, to be able to test your ideas. Uh, this uh, this kind of permanent place on the store allows you to, to do that acquisition you know, kind of naturally. And we have that kind of community that's built in to, uh, to, to get that for you. And like these guys have been very helpfully saying, you don't need a massive community. You don't, you don't need 25,000 users to kind of test your ideas. A few hundred will actually do it for you. Okay, and then um, I guess just to follow up with that uh, train of thought. So my game is around, I wanna say between 90 to 95% done. And um, would you say that that's too late to start the early access pro? I don't think it's, I think they, uh, you may not necessarily be quite as done as you think you are. Yeah, that, that kind of <laughs> happens, you know, so. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's ever too late. All right, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys, appreciate it. Great, so we actually have time for one more question, so that's gonna be you, and uh, then we'll close Thank up. Thank you so much. So yeah. uh, you said a couple of words about uh, the early access on mobile. I wonder if there are any drawbacks that you can say about uh, considering using the early access instead of just releasing the game. So this isn't a drawback, but this is something to be careful of. If you have a, if you have a game that is gonna have a, that you know you have a bunch of really rabid fans about, so, we made three build and battle games in a row for our first ones. And so we've got a bunch of super users. And when these guys come into a game, they just really go all out. And we know we've, we're very, very careful with this one specific group of users because when they get in, the game needs to be right and they'll play it hard. And if it isn't right, they'll bounce out. And so if, although these guys are the ones who really, really want to get access to your game, uh, we don't want them to have access until we've had enough time to tweak it and make it perfect for them. But actually, early access helps here, because we've been able to have a conversation where we're like, guys, the game's not in beta. It's not that thing where it's you know, out in Australia or out in the Netherlands, where we always provide you access, because you, you need to have early access. We're, we're testing it out with this new program. It's, it's not beta. We're going to give you access when it gets to beta, which is the time that we want these people to come in. So, it's actually allowed our messaging to be better, the whole early access thing. It's a pre-beta phase that's got a really nice name. So you don't want to play the game now. It's, it's going to be a little bit crappy. Uh, but that's the one thing that I'd watch out for. You don't want to take these guys who are absolutely going to love your game, but they'll burn out on it and they'll churn out on it if it's not perfect and, and deploy that missile before you're ready. OK, sure. So you say just uh, that if it's not uh, really an experimental gameplay, just better to go full release instead of early access, right? No, I mean for a particular segment of users, the ones that you know will love, uh, when the game is complete, you know that they'll love it and you know that they'll stick with it, like uh, the users that you can cross promote, the ones that are within your network, you, I don't think you wanna cross promote those guys in early access. You wanna cross, you wanna bring in people who can tell you what's wrong about their game, what's wrong about your game, and if you happen to, like the users that come in, because you're being very experimental, you might, you might burn those guys. You might change some things that they don't like. Whereas, yeah, with this group of cross-promoted users, I think just hold on with your cross-promotion until a little bit later. 
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that about wraps up our, uh, our panel on launching successfully on Google Play. Uh, in just a couple of, couple of moments, we're going to bring my colleague uh, Dave Geffon up on stage to talk about uh, building community and what you can do with that on Play as well and his panelists. But uh, thank you all for, for coming to attend this panel. Just Can we give our panelists a round of applause?